Hey, sound check. We hear you, for better or worse. Okay. Same here. Back at you. Good answer. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, today is the, uh, I think the, uh, Either the last day of actual instruction for us, or uh, maybe the second to last day. Oh, damn. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You're the bad pollen day. Uh, hold on. I am drowning. Okay, let's do that again. Uh, let's see. Uh, nice to see some people here that aren't here all the time. Uh, so I was given some thought to what to do for the final exam. And uh, I'll give you a project instead. It's a fun one. Uh, and uh, just to make it interesting, uh, it'll be, uh, it's an assembly language project. And um, here it is, let me demonstrate it. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you this. And uh, you convert it to assembly language. Uh, we haven't had the this. Right, the right Julia thing, yeah? Yeah, well, the whole program. Including the uh, ATU, including the uh, operand thing that we have from the command line? Mm, yeah, why not? <clears throat> but since you have the, the uh, uh, C file, you can replace it one function at a time. Well, there's only the two functions, but uh, well, I guess there's min. Hey, you could do uh, you could do some uh, fancy stuff here with C cell if you want. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Um, I think you've explained so, how to do the command line in in this per and in the means of using the uh, switch from uh, get opt. Well, yeah, the, the, a switch statement is nothing but uh, a bunch of if else's, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, switch is way cooler than just that. So uh, uh, sometimes we have time to do that in this class, sometimes we don't. <clears throat> and um, so uh, the optimizers go nuts with switch statements, they, they do some extraordinary things. Uh, so uh, let's run this program. Uh, this is uh, a Mandelbrot set. Uh, maybe it's not a Julia. Where's Cephas? Cephas would correct me if I was wrong. He's not here. Okay. Um, class is canceled. Cephas is not here. No Cephas, no class. Um, so instead of the, Ju it, it, maybe it's not a Julia set. Maybe it's just Mandelbrot. So uh, what does this program do? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, where am I? I'm going to go back to here. Okay. So uh, this is how the program is run. Uh, specify a width, specify a height, specify a floating point parameter, and uh, run it and redirect the output to a file that ends in PPM. And uh, you'll get, uh, where the heck is the finder? You'll get uh, this. Okay, so everybody's seen something like this before, right? I get to write one of these in Java. Okay, well, now you get to write one in uh, assembly language. Yay! See, here's another one. That's the cl w w close to the classical view. And um, Right now, I can't tell 
what's part of the Mandelbrot set and what's uh, a crumb that I may have spit out of my mouth uh, in, in the past and it's stuck to the screen. So I guess, you know, oh, okay, it must be part of the output because it's moving with the picture. Oh. So any questions? When, when is this project due? Oh, why don't we make it do tomorrow too soon? Just a little. Yeah. Uh, what day is our, the day of our final? Uh, anybody know the day of our final? I can look it up. I'm seeing if it's on the syllabus. Uh, yeah, that's that's the first place to look, but uh, just in case it's not there. I don't see dates. Carthage.edu. And uh, academic calendar. No, summary block. For some reason, a, file, a final is called a summary block. And uh, that's funny. Summary period. Um, uh -huh. It's April 22nd. Uh, April what? 22nd? April 22nd. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, wow. Final exam schedule. Wow. Uh, I see December 7th. 2020. That's I, I know. <laughs> wow, it's that late, huh? Let's see. So this class is 1230 to 210. You are absolutely right. Uh, okay. So the final exam, namely this project, will be due at 210 on Thursday, April 22. Um, let me get that um, into uh, Schoology. Um, add an assignment. And uh, was it P8? Final. Yep. All right, so the category is final and it will be due uh, April 22 at what, what was this ending time? Uh, it is 3 p.m. It was 2 time. At 2.10, so uh, 2.10 p.m. So you'll have the source code and you do the conversion. That is a respectable semester right there, boys and girls. You you've earned you've earned your pay. Okay. Uh, this week is the last uh, so Friday night's the last uh, uh, time that you could submit a uh, late project. Okay, so if you have any projects you want to resubmit, uh, Friday night's the limit. Understood? Friday you know night what? tomorrow. What? Is in tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow night. Okay. Making sure. Yeah, you know, I, I you know, I, can't, I can't assign this. I can't. I, I just can't do this. I can't follow through with this with, with P eight. Uh, all right. So here's the thing. Uh, that will. Okay. So. I cannot, can... in good conscience, uh, go through with assigning P eight like this. What, uh, let's do the following instead. 
uh, that is uh, doing P8 is um, uh, if you do P8 and it's higher than any of your other scores, I'll substitute. Okay, so if you're happy with your scores so far, you don't need to do it. If you uh, want to uh, replace your lowest score, I'll, uh, if P8 is higher than your lowest score, I'll use P8 instead. Does everybody understand that? Yeah, I mean, think about it. If I were, if I were, no, I, I'm not even gonna keep talking about it. So if you are happy with what you have uh, so far, then you don't have to do P8. Uh, if you do P8, and it is higher than your lowest score otherwise, and perhaps one of your scores is a zero, uh, doing P8 will replace your lowest score if it's higher than your lowest score. Got it? Okay, good. Uh, I'll get that source code out to you uh, tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Uh, okay, questions on P7. I'm having, I have a question. I'm having issues initializing a thread and then storing it into the array of threads. I'm getting an error that like loops me into the thread documentation that's in my bin folder. And it gives me like a really long, like multiple page error. And I just don't understand like what I'm doing wrong, like in terms of assigning or initializing or storing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've experienced the same thing. Uh, now, Jacob, were you agreeing with Nate? Oh, by the way, Nate, how are you feeling? Better, and I tested negative, so that's good. Is this an, oh, there you go, nice. <laughs> um, the error you're mentioning, is this an invocation error? Yep. Like, um, yeah, so I'm getting that too. It's on like when I try to push back the vector and add in the elements in it. Um, and I'm not sure why. So you're using a vector of thread instead of an array of thread because I'm using an array of thread. I was using a vector and when I called dot pushback, it was giving me the invocation errors. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it has to do with storing then because we're doing it in two different conventions and still getting an invocation error, so. I just, I don't, I don't know what I, how I should be storing differently, basically. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead. Well, uh, I'll bet you, uh, well, let's take it, let's take a chance. And is your array in one case vector in another case, a vector or array of threads rather than an array or vectors of pointers to threads? Oh, wait, hold on, let me check that. See, the, the problem is probably. Yeah, I have a, a vector of pointers to threads, so that might be it right there, honestly. Well, no, I, uh, I was hoping that uh, it was uh, pointers to threads rather than threads. How about you, uh -huh. Nate? I have pointer to threads. Oh, also, okay. Uh, are you using new? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, how about, uh, are you available during the barbecue hours tonight? Uh, I am not going to be today because I'm doing a fundraiser from four to eight. Uh, barbecue lasts till nine, if that helps. Oops. Well, yeah, then I could probably make it. Okay, how about you, Jacob? Uh, yes, I'll be able to make it. Okay. Like, okay, okay, so let, let's plan on like eight o'clock in the Discord. Sure. And the three of us uh, or anyone else who's having the same problem can join us. I got okay. my own problem, which is whenever I call a function, my 
uh, when I go to the next function, my array or vector is set to a size of zero. And I do not know why that is happening. Uh, willing to take a flyer on that one too. Uh, uh, if there's any parameter passing around here, did you not pass it as a reference and uh, instead uh, uh, pass by value? It is passed by reference and it is still being counted as zero. And I made sure to check beforehand in the function where I assigned all the values and it did have the proper size. Okay, so uh, we'll take a look at that tonight too. Uh, is that okay with you, Thomas? Okay. I'll try to arrive at seven so I don't bleed into their time. Good, good. Sounds good to me. Don't want bleeding. Eh, after uh, you have enough bloody noses to fill the ocean, you kind of get used to the sight of blood. Hmm. Let's change subjects. Any other questions about the project? So mine's a little different. So I sense a few projects uh, for you to grade. And obviously, I don't know how long, what, what your schedule is. But when can I figure uh, to know when, uh, when you're going to look over it and you submit uh, this weekend? But the latest is this weekend. OK, cool. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Um, Morgan, questions on a project? Michael, Jared, Cephas is here, finally. I was a couple minutes late. What are you talking about? I've been here for a while. Uh, okay, and what about uh, project A? Do you remember what I said? Uh, yes, I was there for that. If you believe, uh, if you take it and get a higher score than one of your other ones, it will replace that. Okay, so that's going to stand in place of the final. Are you okay with that, Cephas? Because if you're not okay with that, we can change it. I guess it's fine. Yeah, well, I was just kidding. I don't care what you think. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, very good. So nobody has questions. Michael, Morgan? No. Okay. So uh, we last uh, spoke about the condition variable. And uh, let me find, let me find uh, what note did I write it in? See, now I've got more than one iPad. So which note am I in? March 30th note. Okay, let's see if it updated. And it looks like the update is arriving now. Yeah, good. Uh, okay. All right. So we'll talk about this uh, in hypothetical terms. Uh, let's share is quick time running. Nope. So let's get it running. I was going to mention I decided to look through things again. And apparently, the moment it leaves the function, it deletes everything inside the vector, hmm. which makes no sense. Because I don't tell it to do that. Mm -hmm. Are you constructing the vector inside of no function? I'm confused. No, I'm using a vector that is a parameter and I'm pushing that back and then it's clearing itself at the end. Are you passing it by reference or are you passing a copy of it? A copy of it, it seems. So that'll probably fix it. Yeah, I did, I, I did say the same thing a few minutes ago. Hmm. You told me it was a reference. Uh, that was the one I asked for help with looking at yesterday. I was being a bit of okay. a dumb there. So here's a parent. Um, and here's uh, thread one. 
Okay, so let's write some code. The idea is we want the parent to launch a thread uh, and reliably wait for the thread to start and then uh, thread will exit and then, and then the parent continue. So let's write some code. Uh, we might have a done flag. And then we were going to spawn the thread. Uh, and then we're going to while not done spin. Okay, and then uh, join uh, the thread. And, uh, and we're done. So the idea is that the thread will get spawned. We'll wait for it to set the flag. Okay, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing, right? So uh, we spawn the thread. We wait until done becomes true, and then we join the thread. Okay, so does this? do what I said I wanted it to do, which is uh, if I add in some printouts here, well, I should have added some printouts. Let me do it in a different color so you can see what I'm adding. Uh, print uh, parent, um, print um, child, uh, T1, and then print parent. Okay, so my expected output, the output I want is going to be P, T1, P, and it's never going to be P, you know, certainly P, the first P is always going to be printed first. That's because it's prior to launching the thread. So there's no doubt about that. But I never want to see P, P, T. I only want to see P, T, P, not P, uh, uh, parent, parent, thread. I only want to see parent, thread, parent. So we'll do this, do that. Is there any way for this to screw up? If done is never true. Well, at some point, thread one will run and done will become true. So this is a synchronization problem. And uh, I think it synchronizes. It synchronizes the child thread to the parent, right? But what's, so what's the problem? Is there a, is, what? Well, Separating out, is this correct? Which I claim, yes, it's correct. But is there still a problem with this? And if so, what would that problem be? The problem with this is that's a busy way. That's, that's a spin. You're just spinning there. So the only thing you're accomplishing with a construction like that is to generate heat. Okay, so um, what we want instead is some way that a, instead of spinning, a process can go to sleep or a thread can go to sleep. And we Why want some just yield in the while and say do something else. Uh, okay, that is possible. Uh, welcome to the Mac in 1985. Uh, uh, Y I E, I before E. Yeah, there you go. You could do that, that'd be slightly better. So now we're up to the Macintosh in 1985. 
Okay. All right. So what does yield do, by the way? It tells the operating system to schedule a different process. Or yeah, it's going to give the operating system the opportunity to voluntarily give up the CPU. Okay, so that's better than a spin, sure. Okay, so uh, let's introduce the condition variable and the code for the condition variable is going to look more like it's going to look like this. So uh, we're still going to set done. Uh, obviously, that's wrong because it's in the wrong color. All right, so we're still going to set done equal to false. Uh, and then, uh, so that works, but it's wasteful. And instead, we're going to lock some mutex. So this is the proper way to use a condition variable. Um, okay, so uh, somewhere up here, I've created and initialized the uh, condition variable. And in addition to that, I have a unique lock um, uh, because, well, if I'm writing condition variables myself, then it doesn't have to be a, a unique lock. But if you want to use the C++ condition variable, it has to be a unique lock. Uh, for MTX, so you lock it, right? And then you have while not done, wait. And the weight of a condition variable is taking both this uh, uh, a pointer to the condition variable uh, data structure as well as a pointer to the mutex. But notice that when you head into wait, it, you own the lock. So inside the implementation of wait, uh, inside the implementation of wait, inside the definite inside the implementation of wait, uh, if you are actually going to go to sleep then the lock is unlocked out from under you as you go to sleep. So you're put on a queue of processes that are, or, or execution units, uh, units that are uh, sleeping. And uh, before doing so, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the lock is freed up. Now, what does the child look like? The child, uh, it locks the same mutex or attempts to lock the same mutex. Okay. Uh, sets done equal to true. And then it will signal anyone who is waiting on that condition variable. And then it will unlock the mutex. Okay, so that is what the child will do, or the thread one. Now, notice in both cases. Okay, so uh, both cases, calling wait and calling signal. You own the lock. That is absolutely critical. For this project or just in general when using uh, multiple threads? Uh, well, this is not part of a project, but um, uh, maybe I misunderstood you. But no, in order to use a condition variable, it is absolutely critical that when you 
at the time that you call wait and at the time that you call signal, you own the lock. So the condition variable itself, that data structure, is something that is a shared resource that must be protected. Okay, so uh, what happens? Uh, let's go through this. The uh, mutex uh, is owned by the parent. Uh, let's see, I'll use, uh, okay. So yeah, I'll use this. So the mutex, we get, uh, there's no other threads running. So there's no reason why getting the, the lock would fail. So you've got, not fail, but wait. So now you've got the mutex, you've got the lock, you own the lock. Uh, while not done, well, uh, you know what I missed here? I missed launching the thread. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. So launch thread. Yeah, that would help. Okay, so uh, you own the lock, you launch the thread. And suppose you continue running uh, while not done, uh, done flag is false. So you go into the wait. Now the wait is going to free the lock and put you to sleep. So at some point, the thread finally runs, the lock is available. So it owns the lock, sets done to true, and then signals anyone who's waiting for the condition variable to wake up. The then unlocks the lock, wait comes back uh, with the lock held again. So this gets woken up, this, this thread gets woken up and uh, uh, regains the lock and then unlocks the lock and the parent. So this is accomplished the synchronization, parent, then thread, th then child, then parent. Okay. Now, there's going to be a few questions that you have, uh, namely, why is this a while? For example, and is all of this really important for correctness? So I'll tell you what, Let's examine ways to break this. Okay, so let's say there was no lock. So let's say the code, this is broken. Is this the wrong tool? Yes. Okay, so let's say we set done. Uh, let's see, we're doing, uh, okay, no flag this time. All right, let's do no lock. Done flag equals false. Uh, then, while not uh, done, could somebody uh, mute themselves, please? Who's... Okay, I was trying I think to listen it was, in. I think it was Cephas. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. While not done, uh, wait. Okay, so this one, this version doesn't have the mutex. So what would the uh, thread one look like? It would set uh, done to true and uh, signal. Okay. So what could go wrong here? Ah, damn it, I forgot it all again. Uh, spawn the thread. Okay. So what could go wrong here? That will result in a deadlock. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's say uh, this is time. And this is the parent and this is thread one. So this is before the thread was launched. So this definitely is gonna happen. And this is definitely gonna happen next because this is before the thread was spawned. Okay, now let's say right at that moment, the next thing to run is thread one. So this says, um, done equals true. And then the signal, and then the thread is done. So what happens at the parent? Does the parent behave properly? It gets to the while. Now the parent has come back, the parent is running again. It gets to the while and it finds that the done flag is true or false. True. I don't see why it would. Okay, it finds that the done flag is true, so it does not do the wait and everything's perfect. So this set of circumstances, it worked. But what if the parent was descheduled at a different point in time, slightly different point in time? Would it still work? So uh, let's uh, reset. Okay, so it does the spawn. And then it's still running. And at that point, we're inside this while not done. So it samples the done, right? And it finds out it's false. So it's going to enter that while loop. But that is when it is descheduled. So it's gone into the loop. And it's about to do the wait, but it hasn't done the wait yet. That is when it was descheduled. Okay, so uh, before we, we, okay, so did not do the wait yet. Then the thread starts up, done is true. Signal, but what's different here? The parent comes back and does the wait. How long is it going to wait? Forever. Because we, the conditions were just so, so that the while loop was entered. And at that worst possible moment, which it always seems to be, the parent was descheduled, the thread started, it did its business, it did a signal, but it, at a moment when no one was waiting. So the signal doesn't wake up anyone. The thread's gone now. T1's gone now, and the parent comes back, starts executing again. It does the wait, and it will be a long, lonely wait because no one's ever going to wake it up, and your pro your program is hung. Okay. So I see Thomas in the chat. It was exactly what we, we both Cephas and I said yeah. it was. Okay. Good. So uh, do you see the, the problem with not owning the lock? If you take away the lock, you're going to have a race condition. There's a potential for a hang. So going back to this code, how is it that the, uh, uh, the having the lock 
prevents that from happening. So why does this code work and this code will, this code here will fail? In other words, the code that just removes the, removes the mutex, why does that fail? But having the mutex makes it work. Wait, can you even call wait without a mutex? No, uh, uh, the uh, uh, condition variable wait requires the conditional variable and the mutex. Because the implementation of wait is going to unlock the mutex if you've gone, if you're going to go to sleep. So, and wait is just going to wait for the signal? Correct. Then why do we need the done flag if we can just wait for the signal? That'll be the next uh, example. Well, let's finish this example. Why is having the mutex critical? I don't know if my like thought process of this is correct, but because the problem with the below example is the timing issue. So does this just get rid of the timing issue because it's waiting or like, because it's locked until, you know, it could like sync up. Yeah, so uh, right, uh, a race condition is a timing issue. And this has a race condition. So if the, work, if the wrong thing, if the right thing happens at the wrong time, you will deadlock, that's a race condition. It won't happen all the time, but it'll happen some of the time. That makes it a very difficult bug to find. So it's the mutex, owning the mutex is what's going to prevent the race condition. Let's think about it. Uh, here, the lock is owned by the parent the thread is launched. So if the next thing to run immediately is the thread, it's going to get hung up here because the parent has the lock. If, however, the parent continues to run, then done flag is still false. So you'll enter the loop, wait, will uh, put you onto a queue and then unlock the mutex. Finally, that means that the thread, thread one can run. So it, it goes beyond, it gets the lock, sets the uh, flag of true, signals for someone who's waiting, but yes, the parent is waiting, we made sure of that, and then does the unlock. When the unlock happens, I'm sorry, when the signal happens, the next thing that wait implementation is gonna do is attempt to regain the mutex. And that won't succeed until this finishes. Therefore, problem solved. So when you're thinking about uh, synchronization, once again, a general rule is 
no matter what it is, if it's a shared resource, it has to be protected. So with regard to condition variables, whenever you call wait, when you call wait or when you call signal, you have to already own the lock. Okay, any questions? All right, well, let's, let's eliminate the, uh, let's try eliminating the, the done flag. Okay, well, not eliminating it, let's, let's say, uh, let's say you implemented it as if that's not gonna last. So if not done, wait, why don't we do that instead? So here the race condition is a little bit more sophisticated. Suppose there's thread one and thread two. So when there's more than uh, one thread uh, that you're synchronizing with, if the parent notices that thread, the done flag is false, it's going to do the wait. And when it is reawakened, it will assume that it's all good to go. But what if when thread one finished its business, thread two started running? The thread one did the signal. The parent may wake up while thread two is still doing its business, but it won't know that because it only sampled done flag once. So you need to have this in a while loop and the general rule is Always put it in a while loop. Wait, so you want to have multiple threads changing the same variable? Well, not like you wouldn't have one done for multiple threads. Well, instead of calling it done, let's call it um, available. While not available, wait. But wouldn't you have to have an available for every thread? No, nope. you only need one. Wait, why would you only need one? Okay, well, look at this way. Uh, you have uh, uh, 20, 20 lines uh, at the DMV. And there's only one clerk. So the clerk puts on a green light and somebody from one of the lines goes to the clerk. Yeah, so but there are multiple one that are available. Okay, well, you know, what if uh, uh, fire engines were blue? Hmm? I mean, you're just making up more and more contrived uh, examples. So here's the case. You've got thread one, thread two, and this parent. They're all competing for some resource. And while thread one is using the resource, thread two and parent can't. That's the condition I'm setting up here. So either the resource is available or it's not. You only need one. Okay, so. Uh, the general rule is always code condition variables with a while loop and not with an if. Because and this is definitely the case when there's a, a, a three thread problem, uh, someone, another thread can 
pull the resources resource out from under you if you have you were about to experience one of these bad race conditions so the if has already sampled done found it false so now you're entering into the weight Okay, so when you come back from the weight, you need to check the flag again. Okay, so always use condition variables with a while loop, not with an if statement. Now, this would be much more clear if you had to write a project with it. And we're not going to do that. So, um, I would understand if this isn't making sense to you because it's kind of, um, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's all at this point a thought experiment and you're not actually seeing it, putting your hands on it and getting it dirty. Is our projects involving this use in operating systems? Is that what? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can I actually ask a question about that? Um, yes. I was looking at the OS page that you posted. Um, mm -hmm. What order should we do those? Because I know like there's like an F, S, C, K, uh, P1 kind of, it's a little mixed up. So I guess, um, uh -huh. what would you recommend? Uh, um, let's see, you can still see this, right? Uh, you see my browser? Yes. Okay. Um, GitHub. Okay, uh, so let's just uh, take a quick view of what these projects excuse, are. Uh, okay, so this one could be done uh, in any order. This is like total, this one is totally independent. It's a user land program. So an ordinary program that you would write and it is, it's completely orthogonal to the others. So FSCK could be done in any order. Project uh, two, uh, this one, uh, let me show you. This one is going to leverage semaphores, which by the way is very next thing I'm talking about. I'm going to uh, tell you what semaphores are about. Uh, but so this project would be requiring semaphores and uh, potentially other synchronization uh, primitives. So this is a synchronization project. Uh, this one could be done in any order because it does not use any, uh, this one does not use any uh, synchronization. Is this helping you by the way, Jacob? Yes. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that like one isn't like dependent on another. Okay, so so far none of these have had any dependencies between the others. Uh, this one, P5, let me just make sure, uh, let me make sure what P6 is. Okay, so uh, P6 would be a stretch for you. Uh, FSCK uh, is just an ordinary program, follow the spec, you, you can write the program. It's, it's just ordinary programming. P2, uh, requires learning uh, a bunch of new stuff, including the uh, what semaphores are, and also schmops. This project is about schmops as well. Okay, shared memory, schmop, shared memory operation. So uh, can be again. These, actually, they're all independent of each other. So they can be done in any order. This one. Uh, is a bit of a stretch. And also this one is uh, a bit of a stretch. So uh, if you're, 
looking to start with something that is achievable with what you know, basically now with just a little bit of new knowledge, maybe uh, the first three. Five and six require more knowledge. Oh, okay. by the way, there's a P1 too, apparently. Okay, P1 you could do right now. In fact, you just learned a lot of what it takes. In this course, you, it's for, this is a fork and exec uh, and dupe. So this project you're prepared to do right now. And okay, that's it. So you're prepared to do P1 right now then FSCK, P2, P3, uh, you're also would be ready to do with minimum of new learning. P5 and six require a lot of learning on your part if you wanted to do it over the summer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, other questions before we move on to semaphores? Um, is there a scenario in which um, one would um, one would um, unlock the lock even though they did not intend to unlock the lock? Um, is this easily is an easy mistake to make, or is it um, just? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh uh, working with synchronization and multi-threading, uh, multi multi-processing, it is unbelievably easy to make tiny mistakes that cause deadlocks or bad results. Yes. That's why it's so much fun to uh, code and why you people will go out into your careers as uh, wizards, whereas other people will be mystified because they, they did not get training in synchronization. Does that answer your question, Rebecca? Yeah, it helps. Yeah. yeah. All right. One little slip up uh, and uh, what well, you gotta think of it this way, the operating system, uh, when it tries to do scheduling of tasks and threads and processes, it's your worst enemy. It is Murphy, okay? and. The worst thing will always happen at the worst possible time. You can count on it. That's why synchronization and getting synchronization right is so important. Okay, so this next topic uh, is the topic of semaphores. Now this is a really powerful primitive and it might even uh, satisfy Cephas a little bit uh, in his question about what about the, if there was more than one? Well, sem semaphores is like the first time uh, we're going to talk about synchronizing multiple um, uh, resources at the same time. So a semaphore, imagine you have um, nine resources you can give away. And you have an infinite number or unknown number of consumers who want that resource. Okay, so um, a good example would be uh, the cafeteria. And there is a stack of trays. There are exactly nine trays. Empty trays, clean empty trays. And you have an infinitely long line of high schoolers coming for a camp and who want lunch, right? I can't see anybody's face. I have no idea if you're following me. So you're in the cafeteria. There are exactly nine clean trays and you have an infinitely long line of people who want food. So you have nine trays. That means at most nine of them nine of the people can get food now. The 10th person is gonna to have to wait for a tray to come back and get cleaned. So you, got, you, you have the, did we set the stage? 
correct you know for you yeah so you can initialize a semaphore that knows it has nine resources available so every time somebody calls a wait on the semaphore they will either get one of the trays or they'll go to sleep So under what condition, let's keep with the idea of trays in the cafeteria, under what condition would calling wait force you to go to sleep? Put it in terms of trays in the cafeteria. No more trays. So if the value of the semaphore is currently zero, in other words, there are zero trays available, right, Cephas? So if your calling weight would cause the semaphore's value to go below zero, then you get put to sleep. I mean, you're made to sleep, not put to sleep, like that sounds like you're dead. Okay? So semaphores count it's like a counted resource if you uh, wait on a resource when none are available, in other words, the value of the semaphore is positive, then you go to sleep. Okay, alternatively, under what condition would you immediately get your lunch? if there are trays available. I was going to say if you get there first, but... Well, if you get there first, there are nine trays available. You get your lunch, and now there are eight trays available. Right? Somebody else gets theirs. There's seven, six, five, four, three, two, one tray available. They get their lunch. The tenth person to come along, no trays. They go to sleep. Okay, so semaphores are awesome because they can dispense multiple resources. Now, can you think of a way that you can make a semaphore act like a mutex? You could use the semaphore as your while condition for your wait. Like if if there are no trays available, then wait. Uh, yes, yes. So that's correct. However, what I'm uh, asking is how many resources would you initialize initialize your semaphore with? to make your semaphore act like a mutex. Because what's different about a semaphore and a mutex? A mutex, there's only one, well, I'm giving away the answer, ain't I? There's only one resource. Either it's locked or it's unlocked. So semaphores can be counted number of resources. It's up to the programmer to decide how many resources it should be initialized with. So to make a semaphore act like a mutex, it would be initialized with one free resource. So the first person to grab the resource gets it. The second one 
blocks until the first one's given back. That's exactly what a mutex does. Okay. So in working with semaphores, the one of the most difficult parts is deciding how to initialize the semaphore. And uh, strangely enough, um, uh, actually, when you, in the OS course, you'll see, you'll see it in the book. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's an easy way to decide how to initialize the resource. And uh, that is, as soon as you initialize the as soon as you initialize the semaphore, how many resources would you be willing to give away? All right. And that's how you initial that's the value you initialize your semaphore to. So suppose you wanted to um, let's go back to the cafeteria. And you wanted to initialize the semaphore managing the number of trays, but the lunch line's not open right now. The people are standing there in line, but your servers aren't ready to serve. What would you initialize the semaphore to? Zero. Zero. So that the first person who goes to grab the semaphore goes to sleep. Every person who goes to grab the semaphore goes to sleep. So let me just tell you what the, the there's the sem, semaphore weight and the semaphore post. This says, uh, here's a resource back for reuse. Weight says either give me a resource or I sleep. Parentheses waiting for one. And by the way, guess what? Semaphores are built on top of condition variables. So in order to write your own semaphore, you use condition variables. Can you imagine what the condition might be? In our previous examples for condition variables, we had while not done. What would that look like for if you were coding a semaphore? Okay, we've been talking about it and around it for the last few minutes. A semaphore is a counted resource. Just make an integer and make it greater than zero? Right, right. So the condition variable, the condition is, is the semaphore's counter greater than zero? If the condition, uh, if the semaphore value is greater than zero, then here, here you go, you got one. Here, take it away. So that would be in the while loop. So while, the, res uh, the semaphore's value uh, is less than or equal to zero, keep waiting. Ooh, ooh, one's available, I wake up. Ah, damn it. Somebody else took it before I got a chance. So it went, it went positive and then went negative again before I started to run. That's, uh, now that's a really good example as to why it's a while in a condition variable. Okay, so um, uh, let me just finish out the example of, uh, so let's say uh, an, uh, at the cafeteria where I start uh, setting everything up, but I don't let anybody in just quite yet. So I initialize the semaphore to zero. Uh, people start lining up and nobody gets a tray because the semaphore count is zero. So the 
the parent or some agent is now finished with all their initialization. So they want to put, bring out a stack of nine trays. That would just be doing a post nine times. Because all these folks are in weights. So you do nine posts, then okay, all of a sudden the first nine people waiting online can get trays. So semaphores, Uh, are built on top of condition variables. Uh, semaphores, semaph, oh, just, yeah, semaphores, uh, can uh, work like New Texas. Or they can uh, dispense multiple resources. So some of four are, are really powerful and really cool. They are at the top of the food chain. Uh, one question I have when you've been talking about some of fours is if can you change um, the number that um, the all of them wait at to like one or like we want to have one display tray or um, is it always going to be uh, zero when they wait? Yeah, it's always going to be zero when they wait. If there are no resources available, then at which zero. Or less than zero. Why would you want to account for less than zero? Anybody have any idea? In case some math goes below, or you have to deal with too many things at once. Well, or too many are, things, or too many things tried to do too many things at once. Well, yes, that is the case. Uh, but why not just say if it's less than, if it's zero, you sleep. The end of story. Now, some implementations of semaphores do just that. They only are looking for uh, getting down to zero, but going no further. They don't consider negative numbers. Some implementations do consider negative numbers. And if the number were negative, what would that represent? That they're not, there is not a resource to give it all? Uh, true. So zero and negative means no resources available. But what does a negative resource, negative count tell you? It tells you how many people are waiting. So right now there are zero resources available. So the semaphore's value is zero. Somebody waits. Well, now it goes to negative one. Aha, uh -huh. well, I have one person waiting. The absolute value of that number is the number of people waiting. So the, the condition on which you wait changes a little bit if you support uh, using the semaphore's negative values as a counter. So instead of waiting, sleeping, if the semaphore's value was zero, you would go to sleep if uh, the semaphore's value would become negative. In other words, it's a difference between starting indexing at one versus indexing at zero. So like I said, some implementations don't support the counting of the number of uh, waiting threads, in which case becoming zero is uh, when you wait. But implementations of semaphores, which do allow counting of the number of threads waiting, uh, would put you to sleep if 
uh, your request would cause the number of resources to become negative. is negative. Okay. See this, you got a, a dirty camera. Got to clean your camera. Now it's dirtier. <laughs> There's oil on your finger. It's kind of cool though, we can see through your head kind of. Okay, so the world, the future of the world is multi-threaded. Whenever you have multiple agents competing for a limited number of resources, synchronization becomes critical for both correctness and for performance. the kinds of bugs that happen when you are working with multi-threading and multi-processing uh, are among the hardest to find because they will only show their head sh show themselves at the worst possible time so it'll be a, a the kind of bug the heisen bug right uh, if you're not looking for it, maybe it doesn't happen. But if you are looking for it, then all of a sudden, if you're not looking for it, it doesn't happen. If you are looking for it, no. The other way around, what is a Heisenberg? If you're not looking for it, it happens. If you are looking for it, it doesn't happen. That's what a Heisenberg is. And concurrency bugs are among the hardest to solve and find. It doesn't have to be that way. You pay attention to even this limited overview of synchronization. And if you, if nothing else, you remember what I say is if you have a shared resource, it must be protected. When you're uh, attempting uh, with condition variables, always own the lock before you use the condition variable. You remember those two things and 95% of your concurrency bugs will never happen. So we're not doing any uh, projects based upon this. This is just information. Uh, it would be wonderful if you did some reading and the reading of which this lecture and the previous lecture was a summary can be found at the following location. O step. This is kind of a problem, by the way. So three easy pieces, operating systems, three easy pay pieces, that's O step. However, they kept working on uh, the book and now there are four pieces to the three easy pieces. So they just added the security section. So where will you find the information about uh, that we've gone over? Here is Mutex's chapter 28. Here is condition variables, chapter 30. And here are semaphores, chapter 31. Are you willing to put a link to this on your GitHub? Uh, well, sure. I just said, just search on OSTEP. Yeah, uh, is that okay? Just you just search on OSTEP. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, yeah. yeah. I'll send you an email. But uh, here, while we're here, uh, yeah. what I just was saying is that how many re for initializing semaphores? How many resources should you set it up for? It's well, how many are you willing to give away in the worst possible case of right now? Okay. So I invite you to do that reading if you want to. You'll certainly have to do it during operating systems. 
let's see. Um, let me send you the email with our step. Uh, just search on OSTEP uh, operating systems, three easy pieces. He has to change the name of his book now. Okay, it's been sent to you. All right, thank you. Now, uh, OSTEP uh, book is written by uh, Remzi and Andrea Arpasi Dusso. Uh, Ramsey is currently the, ch the current chair of computer science at, com at the uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison. This is the best, the way they put it, it's the best free op operating system textbook available. Now, it, yes, it is free, but I encourage you to pay for it. Okay, so in other words, uh, send in the donation. You can get a hard copy of it. You can get a, uh, you can buy a t-shirt. <laughs> okay, so give, give me some money. The book is one of the best computer science books written. Seriously. All right, so that's what I have for you today. <clears throat> uh, do you have questions? What did you have to do to get mentioned in the book? Very curious. Uh, well, that, that's actually not the only place that I mentioned in the book. Uh, finding, uh, finding bugs in the book or suggesting changes which might make a passage easier to understand. Uh, for example, that one that I just showed you is uh, he had no discussion previously as to what, how to initialize a semaphore. And it turns out there's a really easy way of thinking about it. And that is, how many resources are you willing to give away right now? And uh, that's the number that you, uh, you define as the value of the semaphore. Okay. There's a lot of good stuff in that book. Other questions? All right, barbecue tonight. Hope to see you there. And uh, boy, I'm looking forward to resuming barbecues in person. They're just not the same on Discord. Uh, we should have ourselves, I think we talked about this already, but we should have, uh, 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 how about sushi? The first barbecue. <laughs> no? no? I, I think, I, no, that's a great idea. I support that. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather have some other type of food. <laughs> Let's do like fancy pizza or something. Fancy what is pizza? fancy pizza? Oh, like deep dish pizza. No, 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 no. Sushi topped pizza. There we go. No. <laughs> Maybe we could do mod pizza because that's a very popular place. Okay, so we are, well, our, our first barbecue next year should be special. It'll be, it'll be black tie and gowns. <laughs> Okay, nobody has anything else to say. Anybody have any good news to share? When I tried the projects again, uh, since like after like two months of like learning all this stuff, they were much, much easier. So clearly I got better at this. So you did something. <laughs> good. All right. Okay, everybody, uh, see you tonight or next week. Okay. All right.